Hello everybody, I am Brother Luke. Let's uh, talk eschatology. Now, I'm going to ask you to reconsider your current views on eschatology. That's what I've been forced to do over the last year or so. Uh, for about 25 years, I held the popular view that you find in America today. Let's call it Darbyism or Dispensational Futurism. But I discovered that there are other uh, viewpoints to consider. And after considering them, I've been forced to change some of my conclusions. But what I want to really talk about now uh, is, let's ask the question, do, do these prophecies that we find in uh, Daniel and uh, Matthew 24 and the book of Revelation and other places, do these apply to the end times, the second coming of Jesus, uh, or do they apply to the first century, uh, the event that uh, it, it happened in 70 AD, the, the Jerusalem War, the destruction of the temple? Have you ever considered that maybe some of the things that you have applied to the future uh, have already happened? So I'm going to ask you to reconsider that, and let's look at some of these things now. I, I have a playlist titled Eschatology that goes into great detail on all of this. Uh, it probably will take you 50 or 100 hours of study if you go through that entire playlist to carefully consider all of this. If you really want all of the details, what I'm going to try to do now is give you kind of an overview of something to think about. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I want you to know that the book of Daniel and what's called the little book in the book of Revelation that, that you, you find in uh, uh, chapters eight, uh, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, the, those um, prophecies are a different vision than the rest of the book of Revelation. So uh, the Daniel and the little book uh, have a, um, a notation for us, and it, it is, these books are sealed. And when a book is sealed, that means it's not for us now, it's for the distant future. So, uh, but we, when we look at uh, the beginning of the book of Revelation, we see that the, the note is, it's not sealed. Don't seal it. And that, what we should learn from that is that um, the events in the book of Revelation, apart from what we find in the little book prophecy, uh, the rest of it is really, uh, uh, since it's not sealed, it's imminent. It's about to happen. As a matter of fact, when we read verse 1, in chapter 1 of Revelation, it says that the time is at hand. And in verse 3, it says uh, these things must shortly take place. And in verse 19, it says these things which are about to happen. So unless we want to really twist language and uh, not accept what is clearly stated, by John, that the events in the book of Revelation, for the most part, uh, these are things that are imminent. They're about to happen. And I believe John wrote the book of Revelation probably about 67 AD. And again, I think that there's uh, a lot of evidence to support that, but you'll have to go to, to my playlist to uh, find the, the supporting evidence for that. But if, if John wrote it in 67 AD, and he, he's telling us these things are just about to happen, that would support this uh, war that was uh, from, uh, you know, 68, 69, 70 AD, uh, the, the Jerusalem War and the destruction of Jerusalem and the Temple. 
So that's what uh, uh, Revelation is describing, apart from what we find in the Little Book Prophecy. That por portion will apply to the end times of the second coming of Jesus. Uh, but consider these verses here for a moment, and what can we learn from this? In Matthew 16, 28, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So uh, Jesus is saying to the audience that he's speaking to right there, some of you will not die before you see this happen. And then in Matthew 23, 36, he says, Verily I say unto you, all these things which shall come upon this generation. So the people he's speaking to, uh, before their generation is, is, is completed, is, dies off, uh, these things will happen. Matthew uh, 24, uh, verse 34, um, this is a, a pivot point in uh, Matthew 24. Uh, everything before it is... Um, uh, about the Jerusalem um, war and everything after it is about the second coming, the end times. Uh, but in Matthew 24, 34, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So everything that Jesus had said uh, prior to that point He's saying that it will all be done before this generation is expired. And so if he said that around 30 AD and 40 years as a generation, then that would fit perfectly with uh, 70 AD, the Jerusalem war and the destruction of the temple. Uh, let's look at some warnings of Jesus' uh, prophecies about this uh, uh, Jerusalem war and, and to consider the implications of this. Jesus said in Matthew uh, 21, verse 33, beginning there, it says, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit grew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do? unto those husbandmen. They will say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. If you didn't know this before, uh, Jesus is telling us in this parable that he has been sending prophets for a long time to Israel, and uh, the Jews have been killing them, not listening to the, the, the prophets. And, and, and finally, God sends his own son, and they won't listen to him, and they kill him. We know that certainly happened. And then he says that what should be done with these people after they killed the prophets and killed the son? Uh, he says in the end that they will cast him out of the vineyard. I mean, that they will uh, uh, 
miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard to other husbandmen. So let's apply this to uh, what the Jews did. And as an answer, God had them all killed. And let's look further at what God does as a response to them killing the prophets and killing his son. Matthew 22 says, and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the king of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, tell them which are bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatling fatlings are killed and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wrought, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. This is another prophecy of Jesus uh, giving us, the, talking about the same situation, that uh, these people did not respond to the Savior when he came. Instead, they, they killed him. Uh, and so the, the answer, God's answer to all of this will be, uh, he will send an army, kill them, and burn up the city. Let's look at Luke 19, beginning of verse 41. It says, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round and keep thee on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation again jesus is talking about the same thing that uh, uh, because they will not accept that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Uh, he says, the day shall come upon thee. And this is what's going to happen. Uh, the, enemy, the enemies will surround them, put a trench around it, and, and then just level it. By the way, there was a his, Jewish historian named Josephus. And when the war... Um, of Jerusalem happened. Uh, it, it, the the, um, the war itself took about three years, but um, the the final siege was was about a, a six month uh, period. But Josephus was there for the early part of it, and and then when people were able to escape, uh, he left uh, with those who who escaped, and, and he ended up. Uh, being uh, captured and uh, changing sides. He, he was uh, taken by uh, uh, Vas uh, Vespasian, who was the, would become the emperor, and he became his advisor. Uh, and so he, he was charged with writing down and recording the details of everything that would transpire. So he, he has a book called the the war of jerusalem and it goes into great detail and everything i'm telling you now and as we continue on all these details are laid out perfectly in his book his book perfectly matches all of the descriptions that we find in these prophecies and later in, when we get into the book of revelation uh, now let's next look at uh, luke 23 beginning at verse 28 
Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. Another warning from Jesus, that there's a day coming that something horrible is going to be coming to them. Matthew 23, uh, 29 through 39 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar." Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. So again, uh, Jesus is telling them that you're no better than your ancestors. Your fathers killed the prophets and you're doing the same thing. You're no better than them. And it's going to come to a, a head very soon. By the end of this generation, payback is coming. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, it, it goes on to say in that same um, statement, he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, Matthew 24 is often called the Olivet Discourse. Um, it, is, um, it is a pretty clear uh, description of uh, the, uh, what will happen to Jerusalem. And then later on, it talks about what will happen at the second coming. Uh, there, there is a point in the middle where uh, it divides these two things, where Jesus says all these things will happen in this generation. Everything that happened from verse 21 through th verse 33 applies to uh, Jerusalem 70 AD. Uh, and then uh, just, I won't read the entire thing, but if you read chapter 24, keep that in mind that Verses 1 through 33 applies to Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Um, and there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And we certainly, I hope you know, historically that's been proven to be true, that uh, every stone of the temple, every stone that made every building in Jerusalem, all the walls, everything was completely disassembled and leveled. Uh, uh, and he said, and he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? So, uh, in the, the first part of this prophecy, uh, an Olivet Discourse, is filled with signs. Things, there are signs that these things are about to happen. Uh, but when we get to the uh, second part of the chapter, uh, there are no signs. 
because those things come suddenly without warning. But what happens in Jerusalem, there's a warning. Jesus has all these warnings that I'm telling you about now, and uh, he goes into great detail telling them, these are the things that you'll uh, see happening just before this destruction comes. Uh, so let's go to uh, verse um, 34. This, let's call this a, the pivot point in the chapter. It says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. That applies to everything he said up to that point. So everything in chapter 24 leading up to this point here, he says that will all be done to this generation. This generation that I'm talking to you right now will not end. So that means within 40 years, this will happen. And then when we, he continues on in the chapter, everything at this point on is talking about his second coming. So keep that in mind uh, as you read that part of the chapter. Uh, think of it as applying to his second coming and where we'll have the second coming, the resurrection, the end of the world, the, the, uh, the judgment and, and the new heaven, new earth and, and into eternity. Uh, but he says, but of that day and hour, no, uh, knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. Nobody knows uh, the date of that. But the, the, the date of the uh, destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, uh, you can figure that out because it has to happen by the end of that generation, which means that from the time that he's speaking to them, it can't be any more than 40 years before that's going to be completed. Okay. Um, uh, let's look now at Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 62. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Well, this is, of course, um, when the Sanhedrin arrested Jesus, put him on trial, and then later took him to Pontius Pilate to be tried there. But they convicted him, and they, they had their chance to accept him as the promised Messiah or not, but they rejected him. And he gave him this warning. He says, you will see me. You, Caiaphas, and everybody else here, uh, anybody who's alive uh, in 40 years later, uh, you will see me come back in the clouds. But as I'm gonna tell you more later, that the language in, in uh, these prophecies are apocryphal and hyperbole. Uh, I'm gonna go into more detail showing you uh, examples of, of that kind of language. But um, that's the kind of language that we do not take literally. We, we have to take it symbolically. Now, how you understand and interpret each one of the symbols, uh, there's a lot to that. And we have to usually go back to the Old Testament to see uh, how it appeared there and the meaning. But um, uh, there's not necessarily unanimous agreement on what everything means. Like, what does a cloud mean? Uh, what does a, a, a red moon mean? What does, a, what does a, a, a dragon mean? All these things are subject to interpretation but they are, should be understood as symbolic of something rather than literally. Uh, but uh, so Jesus um, is going to be the one that causes this to happen in 70 AD. This is Jesus keeping his promise saying that you kill the prophets 
and you're going to kill me. God finally sent his son, and you would you didn't believe it, you killed him, and this is what's going to happen. Uh, this is what's going to happen to this generation of people. And, and uh, here's the last chance in Matthew 27, beginning of verse 17, it says, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could uh, prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. So here, the Jewish people even accepted responsibility for what was done to Jesus. So they had their chance, but instead they chose Barabbas. And now let's take a look at the book of Daniel. Uh, uh, Sorry, with uh, the vision in, in uh, chapter 8. Uh, first of all, it, it does say that it is sealed. And, and, and when we find that a prophecy is sealed, we should understand that this is not uh, imminent, that this is in the distant future. Um, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, and when he was young and strong, the great horn, which is Alexander, was suddenly broken, and in his place there came up four prominent horns, among whom the kingdom was divided one toward each other, the four winds of heaven. So, uh, uh, the, the little horn, uh, in, beginning in verse 9, it says, out, uh, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, but one of irreverent presumption and profane pride, which grew exceedingly powerful toward the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land, Israel. The vision of the evenings and the mornings, which has been told to you, is true. But keep the vision a secret, for it has to do with many days in the now distant future. So, uh, when Daniel wrote this, though, there were about 500 years before these things would happen. This is, again, talking about Jerusalem. Uh, so, it was sealed because it was not imminent. Like in the book of Revelation, it says, don't seal it up because it's just about to happen now. Uh, and also, we look at Daniel chapter 9, it says... Uh, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So uh, again, this prophecy, it says, 
it should be sealed up. Uh, so this is not, this should not be understood as um, um, something that's going to happen thousands of years in the future. It doesn't, some people don't apply this to the second coming of Jesus. Uh, but uh, this one is uh, uh, talking about the, uh, um, the coming of, the first coming of Jesus and his uh, death. So it says here, uh, to finish the transgression, so that is the Jews, all the things that had been done, everything I just read about all these final chances and all these warnings to Israel, okay, they finally had all their warnings, they wouldn't listen, they even killed Jesus. Well, that was the finishing their transgression. And to make end of sins, well, to make an end of sin uh, is when Jesus died for our sins, now sins are uh, no longer being charged against us. Uh, and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciliation means since Jesus paid for the sins, God uh, is not going to hold the sins against us. So now we are reconciled. We're free to have a relationship with God because of Jesus' death. Uh, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. So you know that the only real righteousness is the imputed righteousness we get by believing in Jesus. So, and that righteousness is everlasting. Uh, and to anoint the most holy. Now to anoint the most holy, uh, per perhaps it was anointing Jesus as the most holy, or, or uh, perhaps it's an anointing the temple uh, as the most holy, which is the church, because the church is the temple now. Since the, the temple was destroyed, now we know that the temple is a living temple. We, we uh, every believer, uh, makes up the body of Christ, which is now the temple of God. So, um, uh, Revelation is mostly about the soon fulfillment of Jesus' Jesus' warnings and prophecies about Jerusalem in 70 AD. So what I've shown you is that um, throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus uh, giving all these warnings and explaining that because of what Israel has done over and over again to the prophets and eventually to the Son of God, that they will be destroyed. Uh, Jerusalem and the Jews will be destroyed. Uh, the, that's what he's warned about, and then the book of Revelation is uh, the details about exactly how it would happen. Uh, in a way, um, the um, Matthew chapter 24 um, it is a uh, small account of what would happen to Jerusalem, and that is um, represented in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But we do not find the account in Matthew 24 in the book of John. You wonder why not? Why would not John include this? It's, this account is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, I think that John didn't feel the need to cover it because he covered it even more thoroughly, the same thing, but more, much longer and much uh, thorough, more thorough uh, explanation of it when he wrote the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation and Matthew 24 are the same thing, but Matthew 24 is a very condensed version of Revelation. So, uh, but it, it must be um, understood symbolically, the book of Revelation, not literally, because uh, it's an apocalyptic style of writing. This was a style of writing that was uh, popular from uh, about two or 300 BC until the end of the first century, we see apocryphal style of writing. And uh, is some of the things that I read to you here are written in that style. 
And, and uh, I'm going to give you some examples uh, of some of the Old Testament writings that are apocryphal style of writing. But you, you cannot take that style of writing as literal. Um, but we, we find it elsewhere in the scriptures, in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah. Uh, now, keep this in mind as you read the book of Revelation. Chapters 1 through 3 are epistles that are written to these seven churches in Asia, which is, Asia is really just Turkey. Uh, chapters 4 through 9 and chapters uh, uh, 14, I mistyped that, let me put a one there. Chapters 14 through 19 are about the Jerusalem siege. So when you read chapters 4 through 9 and 14 through 19, you got to think, apply that to the Jerusalem war. And as I said, all those details there, if you read the account of Josephus, it completely mirrors everything you read in the book of Revelation. But you have to understand what the symbols represent. Um, this prophecy is not sealed because it's imminent. What's going to happen in Jerusalem, it's going to happen shortly after John wrote the book. Um, the scroll uh, that's uh, discussed and opened uh, is actually the judgment decree against those who murdered the prophets and Jesus. That's the verdict and, uh, and against them uh, for what they did to the prophets and Jesus. Now, when we get to chapter 10, uh, this is making a transition now to talk about a different subject, uh, which is the second coming of Jesus. Chapters 11, 12, and 13, this is about the little book. Uh, and the, this is a, a different vision. So it, it's a different prophecy about a different time. And it's about the second coming of Jesus. And it's sealed. It's sealed because it's not imminent. It's a, in, about the distant future. So you notice uh, the beginning of the book of Revelation, it says don't seal the book. But... For, for the little book, it says, seal up that prophecy. Uh, in chapter 20, this is the so-called uh, millennium kingdom. Uh, but the millennial, millennial kingdom, uh, as you go through my playlist on these subjects, uh, you'll, you'll find that my conclusion is that the amillennial viewpoint is the correct viewpoint. And that is that this uh, kingdom period uh, it's only called Millennial Kingdom because uh, the, the term a thousand years is used. But that should not be taken literally any more than we don't believe that there, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills is literal. We, we don't think that uh, you know, any, all the hills greater than a thousand, God does no know, it's just one thousand hills. Um, we don't think that Jesus is literally a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. So um, as much as some people want to say you got to take, they take the uh, Bible literally, uh, nobody takes it uh, completely liter literally. Uh, but um, so the millennial kingdom or the, the, uh, the kingdom period, it actually runs from the first coming of Jesus until the second coming of Jesus. But this is described in chapter 20. So when you read chapter 20, you think it go, it, 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 think of it in the terms of the period from Jesus' first coming all the way until his second coming. And then chapters 21 and 22, that's about uh, paradise on earth uh, that's restored and, and eternity. Uh, but as I said, um, Josephus uh, was one of the most respected historians. And, and, and as I said, he defected and uh, uh, became uh, an advisor and confidant for um, Vespasian, who would become the emperor. And he, he wrote what's called the Jewish War. 
And it, it, if you read that, I haven't read it entirely, but I've, I've studied a lot of things that discusses the contents of it. And uh, some of that's covered on the playlist I have. But it's really a detailed record, it's, and it perfectly matches Revelation. Now, let's look at some things in the Old Testament and see if any of this sounds familiar. Um, in Isaiah 34, it says, Come near, you nations, to hear and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all that is in it hear, and the world and all that comes forth from it. For the Lord is angry at all the nations, and his wrath is against all their armies. And he, he has utterly doomed them. He has given them over to slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out, and the stench of their corpses will rise, and the mountains will flow with their blood. All the host of heaven will be dissolved, and the skies will be rolled up like a scroll. And their hosts, the stars and the planets, will also wither away as a leaf withers from the vine. And as a fig withers from the fig tree, for my sword is satiated with blood in heaven. Indeed, it will come down for judgment on Edom and, the, and on the people whom I have doomed for destruction. So the interesting thing here is that here's a Isaiah prophecy about what God's going to do to Edom. And it's... Uh, um, it's the same kind of language we find in Revelation, and yet we know that even though Edom was destroyed, uh, and yet we know that the stars didn't fall from the sky, and the sky wasn't rolled up like a scroll, and heaven wasn't dissolved. Uh, the, these are parabolic uh, uh, terms, language, uh, to, to dramatically talk about how God's going to have this place utterly destroyed. Um, now, here in Ezekiel, uh, it says, Thus says the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set her in the center of the nations, and countries are around her. And she has rebelled against my ordinances more wickedly than the pagan nations and against my statutes more than the countries that are around her. For Israel has rejected my ordinances and has not walked in my statutes. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have more turmoil than the nations which surround you and have not walked in my statutes, nor kept my ordinances, nor observed the ordinances of the nations which surround you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself am against you, and I will execute judgments among you in the sight of the nations, and because of all your abominations, I will do among you that which I have not done, and the like of which I will not do again. Therefore, fathers will eat their sons among you, and sons will eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments on you, and I will scatter to all the winds the remnant of you. So as I live, says the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable idols and with all your abominations, therefore I will also diminish you and withdraw, and my eye will have no pity, and I will not spare you. One third of you will die of virulent disease or, or be consumed by famine among you. One third will fall by the sword around you, and one third I will scatter to all the winds, and I will unsheath a sword behind them. See Revelation chapter 16, and you see almost exactly the same description. Uh, and uh, it continues, Thus my anger will come to an end, and I will satisfy my wrath on them, and I will be appeased. Then they will know without any doubt that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal when I have spent my wrath on them. Moreover, I will make you a desolation and a disgrace among the nations which surround you and in the sight of all who pass by. So it will, so it will be a disgrace, a taunt, a warning, and an object of horror to the pagan nations 
who surround you when I execute judgments against you in anger and in wrath and in raging reprimands. Oh my, the Lord has spoken when I send against them the deadly arrows of hunger, which were for the destruction of those whom I will send to destroy you. Then I will increase the famine um, upon you and break your staff of bread. Further, I will send against you hunger and wild beasts, and they will bereave you of children, virulent disease and bloodshed, and also will pass through you, and I will bring the sword on you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Um, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are, are symbolize these things, and uh, we certainly know that uh, um, uh, if you study what happened to Jerusalem, uh, all the details that I just read to you, these are everything that, 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 were, that happened. It was, well, you'll have to watch the, the, the videos on the playlist to get really all the details of uh, exactly what happened during that war. But uh, probably, I guess there's never been anything like it in the history of the world, and how bad it really was. And it, you may think that um, it's an exaggeration, but if you really learn the details of, of that, it was that horrible. Um, and in, Z in Ezekiel uh, uh, chapter 9, it says, the vision of slaughter is, uh, then in my vision, I heard him cry out with a thunderous voice saying, approach now, executioners of the city, each with his weapon of destruction in his hand. Behold, six men or angelic beings came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north each with his battle axe in his hand, and among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a scribe's writing case at his side. They entered and stood beside the bronze altar. Then the Shekinah glory and the brilliance of God, the God of Israel uh, went up from the cherubim on which it had rested to stand above the threshold of the Lord's temple. And the Lord called to the man clothed with linen who had the scribe's writing case at his side. The Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, throughout all of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh in distress and grieve over all the repulsive acts which are being committed in it. But to the others I heard him say, Follow him, the man in the scribe's writing case, throughout the city and strike. Do not let your eyes have pity, and do not spare anyone. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children, and women, but do not touch or go near any one on whom is the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the old men who were in front of the temple, who did not have the Lord's mark on their foreheads. And he said to the executioners, Defile the temple and fill its courtyards with the dead. Go out. So they went out and struck down the people in the city and they were executing them, and I alone was left. I fell face downward and cried, Alas, Lord God, will you destroy all that is left of Israel, the whole remnant, by pouring out your wrath and indignation on Jerusalem? Then he said to me, The wickedness, the guilt of the house of Israel and Judah is extremely great. The land is full of blood, and the city is full of perversion and injustice. For they say, the Lord has abandoned the land. The Lord does not see what we are doing. But as for me, my eye will have no pity, nor will I spare, but I will bring their wicked conduct upon their own heads. Then behold, a man clothed in linen, who had the scribe's writing case at his sides, reported, I have done just as you have commanded me. Uh, there's a footnote here in this uh, uh, about this uh, chapter, uh, this verse here, verse 3, it says, God begins his departure from the temple. Um, it, it talks about how God left and departed. Uh, and there's an account in uh, Josephus' writing about how there was a, a moment in time where people realized that actually God had just left and, and deserted them. Um, 
So, um, well, let me see. Here's, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 14. It says, For thus saith the Lord God, How much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the noisome beast and the pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast. And Ezekiel in chapter 48, it says, And these are the goings out of the city on the north side, 4,500 measures. And the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates northward, one gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. And at the east side, 4,500 and three gates and one gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, one gate of Dan, at the and at the south side, four thousand and five hundred measures, and three gates, and one gate of Simeon, one gate of Issachar, one gate of Zebulun. At the west side, four thousand and five hundred with their with three gates, one gate of Gad, one gate of Asher, one gate of Naphtali. It was round about eighteen thousand measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. Um, well, some of what I want you to see from this um, uh, reading from the Old Testament is, is that there are many cases we can see where uh, there are prophecies about how God's going to destroy uh, Jerusalem. And, and it, of course, it's, it's repeated what Jesus says, and then it's repeated, what we find in the book of Revelation. Uh, the language is very similar. Uh, some of it's identical, uh, but it's um, hyperbolic and it's uh, uh, apocalyptic in style. What does all of it exactly mean? Uh, well, some of it, I think we can, we can, uh, figure it out uh, based upon history, how it actually played out, and determine what all this symbology represented. Uh, but it's clear that because uh, Israel and the Jewish people, particularly the Jewish religious leaders, continued to reject the prophets and finally the Son of God, that there would be a price to pay for that, and it would all be executed upon them within one generation. As Jesus said, some of you standing here right now will not see death before all this happens. Um, so it is important that we understand that uh, much of what we see in the book of Revelation that we have been taught that applies to end times and you know, the, that we still have to look to the future. Most of that, as I said, really was about what was about to happen really soon to Jerusalem. And then some of it, like the second half, half of Matthew chapter 24 and the little book in the book of Revelation uh, and the last two chapters of Revelation, these certainly are about the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus. That's how I see it. And uh, I know I gave you a lot of information, but really this is only like scratching the surface. This is a thumbnail sketch and just a broad outline for you to have in your mind as you study further. But if you want all the little puzzle pieces so that you can see the picture very clearly, if you go to my playlist, eschatology. Um, all of these things are discussed in much greater detail than I was able to give them to you now. Thank you for watching. Uh, I look forward to your comments and your feedback. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.